Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Today marks the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump, the first time in American history that any president has been impeached twice. Uh, quite, an, quite an accomplishment. A new CBS poll out this morning showing 56% of Americans uh, think that Donald Trump should be convicted. Uh, it's not likely that he is going to be convicted. Uh, we're going to be subjected to a constitutional debate before we get into the substance of all of this. But um, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about um, the future of the Republican Party, whether or not, you know, whether or not we we, we need a, a third party, a third centrist party, a third choice out there. So uh, our guest today is James Glassman, who, uh, by the way, good morning. Thanks for joining me. Well, good morning, Charlie, and thanks for having me. I'm I'm trying to figure out how to introduce you because I was really trying to write down here: journalist, magazine publisher, author, diplomat, and then I actually you know went to your Wikipedia page and realized that basically you run every magazine in America. So I mean, just you know, just, just go through it. I mean, where do we start? We go the Washingtonian, the New Republic, the Atlantic Monthly, U.S. News and World Report, Roll Call. Um, busy, busy guy. You've been writing for. I mean, you sometimes sit back and go, I have been doing this for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, after, after a while, you know, then you, you just about touch every base. I mean, at my age, so I did. Somebody once said to me, I know I'm going to be working for you at some point. And oh, yeah. that, that was always a good bet. I'm, I'm guessing that when you go out in Washington, you run into people like, like pretty much every, in every room, there's got to be at least, you know, two, two degrees of separation that somebody's worked for you or knows somebody that worked for you at some point. Yeah, so. I think that's true. I mean, it, you know, it's a company town and people move around, but uh, we're all pretty much in the same line of work. So um, just for, for, for people who are just trying to get their heads around, you know, all, all the things in your resume, you served as Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs from 2008 to 2009. And then after that, you were the founding executive director of the George W. Bush Institute, a public policy institution. Um, so I, you know, I want to just talk to you about whether or not we're through the crazy, because we it, it still feels as if we we're we're kind of in the middle of it with this impeachment trial. But should we start with a little bit of a palate cleanser here, uh, Mr. Glassman, um, just before we get into the impeachment, because uh, we, we, we live in an era of really, really bad takes. And this is just part of our reality. So one of the jurors in the Senate trial, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, was on the Sean Hannity show last night. And, and it went pretty much the way you would think. But let's play a little bit of a soundbite. I want to interview Joe Biden. I want to interview Kamala. I want to interview Pelosi. I want to interview Maxine Waters. I want to interview Cory Booker, Eric Holder. I got a whole list. Would you consider looking at my list? <laughs> Yeah, I'll be glad to look at it. But unlike uh, <clears throat> you, I actually have to sit there and listen to all this. I'm hoping <laughs> that's a good that point. I'm not going to be, be watching or, every minute. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I have to. Yeah, I got to listen to this crap. So uh, I hope by Sunday or Monday the trial will be over. Here's what I can tell you: If the House managers want to call one witness, the defense is going to call all the people you named and and then some. To my co yeah, Lindsey Graham has listened to all this crap. Yeah, I mean, Lindsey Graham is such a sad story. When I write my novel, he, he's going to be a peripheral figure. But, uh, you know, he's, he is he is kind of a Washington type. And, uh, you know, his latest incarnation, I think, is just it's it's really pitiful. And I don't know what's happened to him. I don't know whether it was the shock of his best friend, John McCain, dying or or what. But and he's you know looking for some other father. I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to do too much psychology. But it's just it's it. I would just say the word is sad, sad. Wasn't there a time when even a a senator who might not have supported the impeachment would have at least gone through the motions of acknowledging the solemnity and the gravity of the moment that this is the United States Senate sitting, you know, in a trial about a president of the United States who had orchestrated an attack on an American constitutional norm that you would take that seriously. But he's like, yeah, I just, I have to listen to this crap. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and uh, yeah, I mean, you remember Charlie on January 6th, uh, he seemed to be singing a different tune and I, I think would have been uh, 
shown the proper decorum, uh, but then w- within a day or two, he'd, he'd switched. So, yeah, I mean, that's what you expect from senators. I mean, you know, I used to run roll call, and that was in the late 80s and early 90s. And I don't want to sort of sound like an old fogey, but it just seems to me that there were different people in the Senate. And, uh, you know, they they certainly would have felt it was their solemn duty to sit and, 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 and listen and judge and not come out before the, the, uh, the trial even starts and say to tell how they're going to vote or certainly not to mock the trial. Well, it's also extraordinary to point out, I mean, this was January 6th. So you and I are, are speaking on February 9th. It's just over a month ago. And it's already been dropped into the memory hole and folks like Lindsey Graham are trying to trivialize it and threatening then to uh, to trivialize the, the the trial if they call witnesses. Do you I don't I I, I go back and forth on this question of witnesses. Um, I, I think that there are that. I think that there are people who could provide some dramatic testimony, some fact based uh, to uh, some some important facts that ought to be on the, the table. Uh, but I can certainly understand why the Democrats don't want to clutter it up with witnesses. You you have a you have a take on witnesses? Well, I, I feel the same way you do. I, I would like to see witnesses, not a whole lot of them. I don't think you need more than maybe a half dozen. I would like to know to establish the the president's uh, state of mind. So yeah. things like you know what was his reaction to, and we've heard these stories about his reaction to watching TV on the on the uh, the day at the time that the uh, insurrectionists were breaking in. That'd be very interesting to know. Um, and I think, I think it would be good to interview or to have some of the insurrectionists, insurrectionists themselves uh, testify. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, they've already talked, many of them publicly, so it wouldn't necessarily be all that difficult to to get sound bites as opposed to testimony, but I think it'd be very interesting because they say they came because of the president. So I think that connection is very important. So there, there, there are a few uh, people who, whose testimony I'd love to hear. Well, those are two excellent points. And number one, the, 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 the president's state of mind, what was he doing? What was going on in the White House? Uh, was he enjoying this? Was he brushing off aides who were telling him he got to intervene and, uh, and protect members of Congress? And then secondly, uh, the 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 president's lawyers or the ex president's lawyers have have implied that that no nobody you know was really you know inspired by Donald Trump. Um, the record is pretty clear that uh, people came to Washington on January sixth because of the president's invitation. Uh, there was no reason for them to be there. There was no reason for them to march on the Capitol except for the things that the president uh, told them to do, incited them to do. The the other thing that witnesses could establish is that it was the president's intention to disrupt the proceedings. The president wanted this certification to not go forward one way or another. And, you know, whether the president wanted, you know, I I don't think the president wanted people to be killed and, you know, and and 75 Capitol police to be injured and so forth. But he did No, there's absolutely no doubt that he wanted the certification stopped. And he tried other means, and this was, I think, the only means he had at hand. So that would be good to establish. No, and I think that this is the this is what get, got me about the Lindsey Graham uh, quote. This is one of the most extraordinary moments in American history. I mean, we always try to analogize this as like Watergate or this is like something. We've never experienced anything like this in American history where you had an attack on a fundamental constitutional functioning that they were – the president of the United States was using all of the powers of his office, not just that day, to overturn a legitimate election, to intimidate people into changing the results, to hold on to power. I mean, really, you can't really imagine – a greater abuse of power than what we're talking about. And there's Lindsey Graham saying, I have to listen to this crap. Really? Yeah. 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 And a, a historic abuse of power. No one's ever done this before. And, you know, this was just the, the culmination of that uh, was this particular event on January 6th, but there were lots of other activities right. that preceded it. So, yes. 
we're of course going to be subjected to a long and uh, tedious uh, debate about whether the, the, the procedure is constitutional. Um, 45 senators have already voted to say that uh, they don't think that it's constitutional to have a trial of, a, of, of an ex-president. I think that's a, I personally think that's a trivial argument. I, I thought it was interesting that the House impeachment managers are addressing this issue. They say, you know, it's unthinkable that so, that the, the framers left us virtually defenseless against a president's treachery in his final days, allowing him to misuse power, violate his oath, and incite insurrection against Congress and our electoral institutions simply because he is a lame duck. And this is a pretty good sentence. There is no January exception to impeachment or any other provision to the Constitution. Yeah, I think it's pretty I, well I, put. I, you know, I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, you know. As, as others have pointed out, you know, the, the, the a president could in his final weeks simply do whatever the hell he wanted and, uh, you know, either resign or expect certainly not to be not to be uh, impeached. And, you know, let's not forget that he was impeached during his time in office. This is this is just the trial that's happening afterwards. You know, everything I've read is pretty convincing. I would say I'm 90 95 percent convinced that this is a perfectly valid way to proceed and it certainly is it certainly should be whether it's in the constitution or not but i think it is in the constitution well it was uh, i didn't get to it yesterday but uh, I, I think it was certainly an, an interesting development uh, kind of a bfd that you had one of wisconsin one of wisconsin one there's my my freudian slip yeah. one of washington's leading conservative constitutional lawyers uh, breaking with the republicans on this issue you know charles yeah. cooper yeah. Yep. Big time conservative, allied with just about everybody in Congress. I mean, he's tight with Ted Cruz, the uh, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he's represented John Bolton. He's represented Jeff Sessions, and he he wrote a piece in the Wall in the Wall Street Journal said basically that that the argument that the Republicans are making about this just defies logic. He says you guys are just completely wrong about this. I don't know that it'll change any minds, but it was kind of a shot across the bow. Yeah, I think completely defies logic. And also, I think for somebody who professes to be a conservative, this is a conservative position to take. I think it's very clear what the plain meaning of the Constitution is. Uh, you know, if, if somebody who doesn't believe in that might say, oh, well, we, you know, things have changed over the years and we have to look at the social construct or something. But I mean, for a conservative, this is the obvious position to take. But you know, there's, there's just all this expediency. That's what seems to be driving uh, Republicans these days. And it's such a shame. Yeah. And the expediency is that this is a dodge. That This is the way that they avoid uh, having to vote up or oh, down on yeah. the president's conduct. They don't want to have to say the president didn't do these things. They want to have to avoid, you know, hide behind this, that we shouldn't even be doing this because I, I think with the exception of the most extreme members of the Senate, maybe Tommy Tuberville or Marshall Blackburn, they look at what the president did and said, yeah, that was pretty awful. Um, so one, one more palate cleanser, um, Laura, Laura Ingram. I mean, if in, in terms of like coming up with bad takes, it's always interesting to me, um, you know, how do you defend the indefensible? And, you know, what happened on January 6th? We all remember what happened on January 6th. We know what Donald Trump did. I mean, and so what, is, what are the Fox News hosts? How do they manage to spin this? And of course, the easiest thing to do is to go back to the what about it, what about ism? Well, let's change the subject. It's like, well, this was bad. What up? So she, Laura Ingram had a little, I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing where she actually has um, a graphic of the Biden insurrection up behind her. So you have to think of this Laura Ingram sitting there with the words Biden insurrection. This is what she said. Now that takes us back to tomorrow's Barnum and Bailey revival in the Senate. Democrats are arguing that Trump welcomed and incited a violent incursion into the Capitol. When it is they who are enticing illegals to bust through our borders, exploit our resources, and commit crimes. And we're not talking about a few hundred. We're talking hundreds of thousands, eventually millions, if the Democrats have their way. There okay. is an insurrection taking place against America, all right. It's been going on for years in the deepest depth of the D.C. swamp. And now its figurehead resides at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. This insurrection seeks to overthrow everything we love about America by defaming it, silencing it, and even prosecuting it. Wow. 
that's uh, that's throwing it up against the wall, isn't it? <laughs> it's like Laura, that's your best shot. Yeah. <laughs> so, like uh, illegal immigrants. Um, you know, I've known Laura Ingram for a long time. We were actually very good pals about twenty years ago, mm. and she took a she she was a, she look she was a she was a, a center right person just like I was, and and I still am, and uh, you know I can't. I can't necessarily fault her for wanting to pursue a quite quite a lucrative career, but it's it's you know it's a shame. It's the same thing as much the same thing as Lindsey Graham. I mean, you know, Laura's too smart for this kind of nonsense. But uh, you know, that's that's the best shot that you've it's got. Like, is that why aren't uh, we talking about the caravans? I mean, it really is. Like, about what about ism, Charlie? Yeah, yeah, like, just go go through the cards and go. Okay, Mexican rapists, uh, immigrants coming over the wall. They hate America. Uh, the caravans, the caravans are coming. That's the real story. Yeah. Okay, so so James, let me tell you, let me tell the listeners really why I really wanted to talk to you today. Um, I'm not supposed to mention this, so let's just keep this between us, okay? Let's not make this public. But you, 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 you and I were part of this, you know, super secret Zoom conference of, you know, great thinkers about the future of conservatism and everything. And um, I, I shouldn't say this in public, but I mean, there was a lot of blah, 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 blah. But the, the thing that really stood out to me was, you know, your presentation, which was very striking. And you were the one of the few definitive people saying, we need to have a third party. Uh, there's no future for the Republican Party, but we're staying in the Republican Party. And so I, I wanted to immediately texted you or slacked you and say, hey, can you come on the podcast? Because I, 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 I want to go through this because this is one of the most interesting questions that I think folks like us have to wrestle with is, you know, do we, you know, do we stay in well, I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself a Republican, but, but you stay in the Republican Party to salvage it, considering that America needs at least two rational parties, or is it unsalvageable and, you know, are we better off going a third way? So I want to make you make 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 your case for which direction we should go. Certainly. And thanks for the kind words. And I, you know, I thought about this for a long time. It seemed to me that the timing was absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I got my five minutes before this distinguished group. So now I'm going to have another few minutes before your distinguished group. Um, you get more so than five I made, So, you know, so in my talk, I made three points. Uh, the first, and I think we were kind of, in a way, going over this in the, in the first part of this podcast, is that the Republican Party is not going to change anytime soon. It's really not. Um, this, the party doesn't stand for what it used to stand for. And, uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene had it right when she said, the party is Trump's, it doesn't belong to anyone else. I mean, if it does change soon, then forget about starting a new one, we don't need that. Or if Trump's own party, the Patriot Party, uh, you know, gets off the ground, we don't need it. But I think that's extremely unlikely. You know, this is a party, the, the rank and file by a margin of 70 to 13, still believes that Trump won the election. Uh, and, uh, you know, by, uh, by a four to one margin, they'll support him if he runs in 2024. So, I mean, this, this, is, this is his party. And I think that trying to change the party is going to be a, what I would call a soul deadening slog. It's just not something I want to do. And it's going to be extremely difficult. And, you know, it, it's worse. Let's put it this way. It's worse in the states than it is in the national part of the yeah. world. I mean, you have states censuring Doug Ducey. I mean, a, a, a conservative Arizona governor uh, censure, of course, you know, censuring Liz Cheney. Um, the Oregon party called Damn, January 6th false flag operation. Yeah. So, so my first point, and I think kind of the main point is we're not going to be able to change this party. And if you believe in the principles of uh, traditional republicanism, um, you're, you're going to you're going to want to either change the party or start a new one. And I think changing is virtually impossible. And you know, my second point is it can be done. Uh, we can go through the details later. I don't want to dwell too much yeah. on it, but. It, but the practicalities are it can be done. And my final point, which actually I think at the this uh, summit conference uh, resonated the most, is um, it's 
it's going to be exhilarating. Um, I think it's going to attract a lot of attention. I think it's inspirational. And building something on our own is going to be a lot better than trying to fight the forces of darkness. Um, and we can do it. So that was the point. That was essentially my argument for a new party. Well, I, th I think this is highly plausible because you know, if you ask the question, who is more likely to be purged in the Republican Party, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Liz Cheney, you really it, it, it kind of encapsulates it because I think it's more likely that Liz Cheney would lose a primary than that Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to go anywhere. So absolutely. Um, and I think that tells you about the way things are going to go. The, the, the prospects of a non-Trumpy candidate heading up the ticket in 2024, slim and none. OK, so this third party. What is it? What do you call it? What does it stand for? Well, when I first wrote about this in a piece I did for Newsweek, I I called it the Integrity Party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the name is up for grabs. I called it the Integrity Party for contrast. Um, I also felt that um, I didn't I didn't really want I don't I didn't want to use the word conservative because mm -hmm. and this is something that's debatable, but. And it's an important debate. If you if you start a, a new party by breaking off from the Republican Party, do you want to try to attract uh, independents and even Democrats? And my answer to that is yes. Uh, others might differ, but my answer to that is yes. And by the way, you know, eleven percent of Democrats call themselves conservative, so you know it's possible to put conservative in the name. Um, I would rather have a kind of more general anodyne name like Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know the answer to that question. I also don't know the answer to the question of exactly what the platform is going to be. I know the things that the current Republican Party has forsaken, and I'd like to see those those reinstated. But um, so I think that I think there a lot of the there are a lot of important questions to add, to answer. And uh, so basically, it's just a kind of a, a, a non crazy, non corrupt party that is not as left wing as the Democrats. Uh, yeah, I mean, not very different, frankly, from the Republican Party as we as we knew it up until 2015. I mean, so, when so, you look at the yeah. array of Republican presidents, at any rate, they tend to be center right, uh, virtually all of them. Uh, I would say pretty much all of them, maybe not Ronald Reagan, although I think he governed from the, from the center right and not absolutely not crazy. So uh, that's that's what I want to do. Yeah, we're not going back to zombie Reaganism. We're, we're not going to go back to George Bush, e either George Bush. So, again, I'm, because I'm, I'm really fascinated no. by this, you know, so no. what, what and, that, does... and that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not I mean, we, we want a modern party. I mean, neither of these two parties, I mean, one of them is 160 years old, and the other one, probably you could say it's 200 years old. Um, none of, neither of these two parties has adapted to the modern age, and it's because they've got a, a duopoly, a, a kind of self-reinforcing duopoly. And, you know, I'd like to see a modern party, frankly. And, and my model, to tell you the truth, if I have any model yeah. at all, and it's not, it's not, tremendously successful, but it, at least it, it won pretty quickly, is uh, what happened in France, is mm -hmm. the uh, is the En Marche party, which was started w within one year of its starting. It, it took over uh, the presidency and the legislature in France. And it, it was a center party or maybe center, slightly center right by French uh, standards, but it was a modern party and it wasn't made up of old old party hacks. It was you know, half the people who were elected were people who had never had any political experience at all. That's the kind of thing I'd like to start. You know, I, I, I was very interested in that when that happened as well. Um, and the pushback that I got was, well, um, remember that France is not America and that they have a much different political tradition, including a more robust multi-party system Whereas our system is so binary, it is so the the two party system is so entrenched in the American uh, political culture and legal system that it's just much more difficult to do that here. There's no doubt about that. And I spent a lot of time five years ago or so trying to do one small thing, which was open up the final fall presidential debates to a third candidate. Mm. 
which was one of the one of the obstacles that the uh, the duopoly has thrown in the way of any third party or independent candidate. I mean, if you can't get in the debates, forget it. You, you're never going to get elected president. And they've set it up in a way where it's almost impossible to get in the debates. So that's only one example. Obviously, there are many, many more examples. But let me let me let me just give you an example of something that can can help break the duopoly. And it's, it's very simple. I mean, there's a lot of fear among Republicans that they're going to be primaried. You've yes. heard this, Charlie, over and over again. And it's a real fear. There's no doubt about it, because Republicans make up self-identified Republicans make up only 25 percent of the electorate. And how many of those people actually vote in primaries? Not very many. So it's the base. It's the people who are, in, in this case, strongly in favor of Trump, who are doing the uh, making the decisions on who the Republican candidate is. And because of gerrymandering, you know, the vast majority of seats are either safe Republican or safe Democrat. So whoever in, wins the primary is going to win. Now, what happens if a if a uh, conservative center right person doesn't participate in the primary? but in fact participates in the general only. And in most states, you can do that. So then you've got a completely different dynamic. And that dynamic is actually going to drive the, the loony uh, Trumpist more to the center, probably drive the Democrat more to the center as well. So that's the kind of thing that could change despite the obstacles to a third party um, with, with, with you know, this idea that, that we have been discussing. <laughs> Okay, so tell, t- tell me h- how, how it works, the details. You laid out kind of a scenario when we last talked about this. How does it, what is the mechanics of setting it up at the state level, the national level? Right, so understand that I am, I am not an expert in this. I'm not mm-hmm. a campaign person. I'm kind of a policy person, but I, I, you know, I've, I've been involved in a few uh, of these uh, reform kind of ideas and movements. So um, so first I would say that, you know, there's a question, you know, are there enough people here for the, for a new party? Right. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, three quarters of Americans say they're either conservative or moderate. Um, Eight million Republicans, as far as we can tell, don't support Trump right now. Um, they're independents, they're Democrats. As I say, 11% of Democrats say they're conservative. So I think there are enough people. How would you begin? I would say you would form a an exploratory committee, um, you know, of a dozen or maybe two dozen people. Try to find some high profile, former or even better, current uh, officials, either at the national or the state level, who would who would join and make a, a, a and make a big deal out of that. We'd obviously have to come up with a name. Um, we would start a party organization, which is called a 527 under the law. Probably would also start a C3 and a C4, just mm-hmm. get the organizations down, uh, recruit, raise the money. And I think the money is there. I mean, there is a huge amount of unhappiness among traditional uh, Republican donors. And uh, then the next step would be a convention, which I would, you know, love to have in the fall. You could do it in the spring, but I think in the fall would be great. And my suggestion was to have it in Ripon, Wisconsin, which I know, Charlie, I you know, uh, which is where the Republican Party started. A little white and, schoolhouse. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've never been there, but I'm sure you have. Yes. Um, yeah. This so, is, that, that, is, that is the home of the, of the old Republican Party, the Lincoln Republican Party. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you have a convention. So then you have a convention, you, and at the convention, you know, the, the, some of the answers to your questions would be, would would come, uh, would would resolve themselves. You know, wh- what is it? You know, what what is the platform going to look like, and and a strategy. And you know, what I would advocate as a strategy is that we find the right states to run our own candidates in. For example, uh, states where someone can win without a majority vote. I mean, there are states where, uh, you know, uh, Senator Murkowski won election in 2010 with 38% of the vote hmm. in Alaska. There are states like that. So find, find the right states for congressional and statewide candidates. And in other races, endorse Republicans or Democrats who share our values. I think Americans would really like that if they saw that happen. 
this and, this, uh, this this is the key point. This is where where I was you know the point that I made when when I had my presentation was whatever we come up with, it has to be flexible. That there will be times when you have a offer a third choice, just a rejection of the two major parties, and then there are times when maybe you're going to support um you know one of the rational Republicans, and then there will be times when you support the Democrat against a completely crazy Republican where you don't want to you don't want to split the the vote. So there are three options for this this party, this entity that we're talking about, right? Yeah. So you you're talking about it as as a caucus or as a well, I'm just asking you. You're saying that you could endorse. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. 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 You can in, exactly. I mean, and this is this is not a new idea. It's uh, there are some parties. The Conservative Party in New York is the best example that endorses. Uh, it, it actually sometimes right. Uh, People are on both the conservative and the Republican ticket. So we can do that. Uh, the You can't do that as a Republican or a Democrat. I think it's it's not. No, it, do, it, it doesn't work. So, the, you know, this this entity, this unity party, whatever, would you think of it as a centrist party or a center right party? Well, that's a great question. I personally think of it as a centrist party, mm-hmm. but um Others would might think of it as a center right party. I think that's something that has to be resolved. I do believe this, that this the narrative is that this party is starting as a breakaway from the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Okay. In other words, this is not a de novo centrist party, which some people have talked about in the past. No, that's not what this is. This is a group of people uh, who are who are talented and have served in as as officials. And who feel that the Republican Party is no longer the home for them. There's no way to change that. We're starting a new party. But unlike either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, we will welcome all comers who who share our values and who share most of our policies, the policies we advocate. They don't have to share them all. In other words, I don't think we should we should have litmus tests. I don't, I don't think we should say you can't be a member of the unity party or the integrity Mm -hmm. party if you uh are anti-abortion or pro-abortion or anything like that but we have values like uh america needs to lead in the world um that or for example that we have to have fiscal responsibility i mean there, there, there there are a few there there are a few values that i think people need to share so yeah. But that's just me. You know, others may have a different view, but I, I think it should be a center rather than center right. I do think that, that you know, part of this project would also be reconceptualizing what conservatism is, because the, the, the word has lost so many, has lost so much of its meaning. I said that Mona Charon wrote a great column where she says she's, you know, a lifelong Republican, lifelong conservative, doesn't even want to call herself a conservative anymore because it's been co-opted by white nationalists and conspiracy theorists and associated with all sorts of reaction, reactionary, anti-democratic uh, trends. But so I, I think part of it is is to say, OK, you know, what are these values? Um, because the Republican Party really is no longer about ideas. Um, Chris Hayes has a piece in The Atlantic where he says, you know, if Donald Trump would have come out in favor of a $15 an hour minimum wage, Republicans would have just they would have gone along with it. I mean, they would have just whatever he would have said, you know, there's so there's no core value. No, no. I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, this event that we went to last week or that we were on the phone for was called the New Conservative Summit. Mm-hmm. And I understand the yearning for a new definition of conservatism or a new, you know, but I, I, unfortunately, I think that word is kind of played out almost in the way that, that liberal is yeah. now means something completely different from what, what it used to mean. And that's why I, you know, my own feeling is that the name of this party should actually not have much to do with any uh, kind of common nomenclature for yeah. uh, positions, political positions. But well, I don't know. I think we can sort all that out. I, I would just, I, I mean, my feeling is let's get going. Um, you know, it, maybe we can sit around and wait till the end of the the impeachment trial and see whether uh, 17 Republicans have voted to impeach. But other than that, you know, I, th- I think the die is is cast, and uh, 
and I think it's all you can you can look at individuals like Kevin McCarthy. I mean, my joke is this is the new McCarthyism. It is somebody who is just so scared to death of Donald Trump that he'll just do whatever Trump tells him to do, even though Trump is no longer president. And he is the Kevin McCarthy is the leader of the uh, of the uh, minority party in the House and actually quite close to a majority in the House. But he just goes along and uh, that's the problem. And it's not going to change. So we're going to get an answer to this very, very quickly, maybe within a week, whether there's 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 any residual remnant of, uh, of of principle or decency in the Republican Party. I'm not optimistic about all of this. I guess I'm a little bit torn because I think it's very important that, for example, that we find a way to, you know, to support the 10 uh, Republicans in the House who basically put their necks on the chopping block by voting to impeach Donald Trump. I think it would be a disaster for them to be all defeated. On the other hand, I completely agree with you. I think that the Republican Party as a whole is not going to be salvageable, um, uh, you know, short of some, you know, cataclysmic defeats. The one objection, you know, we're going to hear from this discussion about a third party is, well, doesn't the third party then, you know, you know, open the door to another Trump? That the big fear, of course, has always been that you'd split the vote, that Donald Trump might have been able to be, you know, elected or might still be elected in 2024 with 38 percent of the vote if there is a third party. So how do you answer the uh, the argument that, uh, the, you know, what you should be doing is becoming Democrats or vote for Democrats, because otherwise you're going to open the door for more minority government? Right. So the only way that would happen, of course, is if. Democrats came over, lots and lots of Democrats came over to the new party. I mean, more likely, much more likely, the uh, the spoiler effect is going to be to draw Republicans who would normally have voted for the Trumpists to our party yeah. and maybe help elect Democrats. That's that's the dynamic that I think exists. And actually, that's a good dynamic. Because what that does is forces the Trumpist party to move more to the center. You know, one of the reasons, and I didn't really go into this very, I, I think I have one sentence in my talk about this, but let me, because I have a little bit more time here. Let me just give you what I think is uh, kind of the best metaphor for this. And it was, uh, it was uh, Peter Ackerman, who's done a lot of terrific work on third parties and independents who, t who told me this. So let's say you've got a 200 yard strip of beach and um, there are two lemonade stands that want to start up. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what are the optimal positions for the lemonade stands? Well, the answer is at the opposite ends of the beach, because that way each one of them, assuming they're selling the same kind of lemonade, gets half the business. So from the center point to the far edges. So 50, 50, that's fine. So now let's say a new entrepreneur wants to start a, a lemonade stand. Where should that person start the lemonade stand? In the middle, obviously, because then he or she has the can expand out, can get business mm. from both sides. So here's the key, though. What happens to the other two lemonade stands? What do they do? Do they stay out at the outer edges and attract maybe 25% of the business each? No. They go to the middle. Everybody, the three lemonade stands compete from the middle. So maybe they're not in the precise middle, but it certainly pulls them in. And that's what happens when a third player enters a duopoly. And that's what would happen here. So, yeah, you'll hear a lot of talk about spoiler. But what you don't hear about is how both the Republicans and the Democrats will have to move in order to attract voters who would go to this third party. So let me ask you a question that I was asked yesterday, and I don't think I had a good answer for. So I was asked in an interview yesterday, can you explain what Donald Trump's hold on the Republican Party is now that he's no longer in elected office? I mean, it really is kind of extraordinary that you have this uh, defeated disgrace, now twice impeached president, still has this iron grip on the Republican Party. Why? What do you think? I really think that it's, I think it's uh, being primaried. And that's why I th that's why I think that this um, this idea of a third party works so well. I mean, look, everybody who's gone up against Trump, you know, 
Mark Sanford, Jeff Flake, and there aren't that many, but they're yeah. all, they all either lost or decided to drop out. So they didn't lose. And, you know, the reason for that is what I explained before. There, first, there aren't that many registered Republicans to start with. And second, the ones who turn out for primaries are this base that Trump can rile up. And so they get nominated. And if they're in a district where it's unlikely that a Democrat's going to win, uh, they get elected. And but so, the, the, I mean, you yeah. saw that with Marjorie Taylor Greene, sure. perfect example. Well, that explains the elected representatives, but how do, how do we explain the hold over the grassroots? The fact that still you have, you know, large percentages of millions of Republicans that still look at Donald Trump and go, yeah, we're okay with that. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind giving him four more years in, 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 in power. So those, the, how do we explain that? Not just the it's not just the grassroots. It's people that I have uh, known and to some degree respected throughout my life. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I can't yeah. speaking I can't of soul crushing. I can tell you this. Uh, you know, I don't know if I should tell you. I'll tell you this. <laughs> I, you know, I, I I was given some office space, and I'm not going to name the foundation at a foundation. And uh, that I, whose whose board I considered to be quite centrist, mm -hmm. quite and certainly quite intellectual, smart, really good people, and I was kicked out of this office because I supported Biden over Trump. Mm -hmm. Now it's not a big deal. I got a very nice home office. Don't I don't want anybody to pity me. But I'm just saying, it's not just the rank and file. And I, I think part of it is look, you know, when Trump was when he was president, he did things that a lot of conservatives liked, you know, uh, like the tax cut, which I didn't think was very well constructed. But um, so I think there's that, you know, but uh, but I, 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 it is I a phenomenon. I don't it understand. Is, it, it is. It is extraordinary. I mean, it's, it is a degree to which the politics has become so tribal and you kind of wonder whether or not mm -hmm. politics has become less about policy differences at all and just about who rules who is in control you know who owns who owns who and, and and at that point then these these details like character and decency and tax cuts really take a backseat to just simply the the identity politics you you know and the, you know you and me we were regarded as traitors not because mm -hmm. we took positions that were horrible necessarily but because we were not part of the team and I think a lot of us, you know, have the same, have sort of the same experience. You know, you, you know I think your, 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 your story goes to the, the point. I often wonder, you know, we don't give enough attention, I think, to the role of the donor class in the Republican Party. We talk about the politicians, we talk about the, pub, you know, the media, we talk about, you know, the grassroots. But I do wonder if the donor class had not gone all in, whether the, the scenario might have been a little bit different, but they did. In, in, including folks who were very, very adamantly anti-Trump in the beginning, so therefore you assume knew better, smart people, and yet they decided that they were going to do it, which meant that a lot of the resources on the right, uh, the think tanks, et cetera, um, you know, you know had, had, had the thumb on the scale. Well, actually, it became a requirement, right? You were a heretic if you didn't go along. I mean, and I think that's one of the greatest failures is what's happened with the think tanks. Yes. I mean, my think tank, the one I worked for for 20 years, American Enterprise Institute, uh, it was definitely not in the tank, so to speak, for Trump. But it certainly didn't lead the opposition and didn't say, look, I don't mean in a political way, but in saying, hey, just a second, all these things that we believed in, this this administration doesn't. You know, like yeah. we're, we're for free markets. We're, we think immigration is a good thing. Uh you know, we we believe in American leadership, um, and where were they? You know, yeah. where where was their intel the, the intellectual power that you thought was so important, starting with Reagan, it just dissipated within within seconds. It, it, it and felt I think like you're that. right. I think the tribalism is definitely part of this. Is my team? It's yeah, the team that I'm on, and I don't care. You know, I'm rooting for the. Uh, I'm still rooting for the New England Patriots. You know. I don't care who they trade away. Uh, I don't care who they are. That's that's my team, and I'm not going to change it. So. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you look at the, the the Heritage Foundation and the Bradley Foundation, and then the folks out at Claremont. What happened to them? And you, you know, I read mm -hmm. some of the publications and go, "Boy, I remember when these were, these were serious intellectuals. These were serious people." And now it's 
It's uh, the transformation took place so quickly and so dramatically over the last four years that that's the one thing. Yeah. Donald Trump is who he was, but that transformation and how thorough it was is still amazing to me. I agree. And, 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 and you know, this is a much longer discussion. I think the Claremont people are a little bit different because I think they they came up with a some kind of intellectual justification, which I don't and I don't think it's in a cynical way. I think they actually believe in this sort of nationalism. Uh, I think it's completely wrong. But I, I what I what I think is worse are people who were more traditionalist Republicans who believed in, you know, these kind of center right values who were uh, co-opted. And a lot of them, as you say, were in the donor class and the donor class, you know, you kind of understand it's not just tribalism. It is it's um, it's the ability to get things done that they want to get done when their guy is in office. So, yeah, they're, they're that's important. important. James Glassman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it very, very oh, well, much. Thank you, Charlie. And congratulations on everything you've done with the Bulwark, which is fantastic. Well, really. thank you. We're, we, we continue to have fun, amazingly. And thank everybody for listening. To, uh, thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.